everyone, it's Lina of Dance by Lina, Dancewear, or Dance by Lina if you want to use that handle. Um, today's vlog is going to be with Yasmin Nagi, and she's the principal dancer of Royal Ballet. I had such fun time with this interview. This was one of the best interviews, if not the best interview I did this quarantine. I am sure of it 100%. I just want to say thank you again, Yasmin, for giving me that opportunity to be able to talk to you. I know a lot of people don't get to do this, so I was so thrilled to have had the chance to get to know her more and also how much she loves the art and how much of a real person she is and how human she is. You would love this interview. I hope that you all enjoy it and leave us a like and a subscribe of course and don't forget to comment more questions or the people you'd love for me to interview in the next vlogs and stay tuned for more! We'd love to get to know you first because of course I mean I have read about you but then it would be nice to hear it from you how, um, how you got into ballet and why you started dancing, what were your first memories of dancing? Hmm. So I, uh, my first memories of dancing was simply hearing classical music. I loved classical music, I thought it was so beautiful and I always found myself just having to express myself and move. Um, so my parents thought, hmm, this child seems that she can't sit still and she always wants to express herself when there's music. Um, so that's how I, I got into dancing is because I had this urge to move and express myself uh, with the music. Um, and then more and more, um, I saw some ballet videos and thought that it was so gorgeous and stunning. And I studied with gymnastics, actually. That was the first kind of lessons I had um, was, was gymnastics. And then when we started doing backflips and complicated movements, my parents thought, oh, we don't want her to get injured. I was very loose. And, um, and that's when I found ballet. And it was kind of uh, love at first sight. I loved being able to move to this beautiful music. And I loved the challenge of having to improve. Um, and yeah, that was, that was kind of my introduction to dance was starting with classical music, starting mm -hmm. with gymnastics, and then finding ballet. Wow, my gosh, that's a really nice way to get into dancing, you know? Normally, uh, kids would watch their first ballet and think they'd want to dance, like, just from watching. But for you, it was from the music, so it's really... Yeah, different way to get into dancing. But you started with gymnastics. And uh, do you feel like it helped with your ballet training also? Or Yeah, I think, I think it definitely did. Uh, I know that a lot of dancers start with gymnastics, either alongside mm -hmm. their ballet or, or that that was their starting point. Um, and I think it's really great for flexibility, for coordination. Um, and it's interesting to think, you know, what if... I pursued gymnastics. Could I, could I be an Olymp Olympic gymnast now or would I have given everything up? It's really yeah. fun to think what else could have been. Um, but yeah, I think it, it definitely helped. And also some concentration techniques in picking up the steps and, and the way that these things were done. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I got into gymnastics first also before getting into ballet. So I can kind of relate with the whole gymnastics yeah. and the disciplines quite different um so yeah let's get to uh questions about uh you being in the royal ballet i actually got to watch you last year and um that was in japan <laughs> and i think you uh it was the final show in yokohama if i'm not mistaken so i went with all my students we went on a field trip just to see the royal ballet shows so we were able to catch you in Donkey also and at the same time the gala show uh how yes. is it like dancing with the royal ballet i've seen some interviews where you know you really love um the company and i can see that you really enjoy the environment so how did you get into it maybe you can describe to us like how you started out or sure 
So I, um, I went through White Lodge when I was young from the age of, I joined from the age of 12 and then the lower school uh, based in Richmond Park, which I kind of compare it to Hogwarts of ballet. It's a <laughs> school where you do your ballet alongside academics. And I was there from 12 until 16. And then I progressed to the Royal Ballet Upper School, which is in Covent Garden, just across the road from the Opera House. And I was there for a year and a half. Um, so I, I had a really quick journey through the upper school, as it's usually three years. Um, and in my second year, at the age of 17, I believe, I was told by the then director, Gaylene Stock, that she wanted to move me to the third year. Um, and then halfway through my third year, uh, Monica Mason, who was then the director of the Royal Ballet, offered me a contract um, and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I've got something to go to in September. And then she said, no, next month, to join next month <laughs> in April 2010. So that was, of course, very exciting for me. Um, and at the time, I was working with the company as a student. We were doing uh -huh. uh, Cinderella at the time. So I was there as a student doing one of the stars, which was one of the corps de ballet roles. And it was so surreal for me because one day I walked in as a student to perform with the company and the next day I walked in as a company member. So the transition was, was very instant. Um, and I remember being in company class and some of the company members coming up to me and saying, oh, sweetie, shouldn't you be in a uh, school uniform? <laughs> and I said, oh no, today's my first day as a company member. Um, so that was a funny, a funny transition just from one day to the next into the company. Um, and of course it was everything I dreamed of, uh, all of my student life is to join this beautiful company. And so it was a very special moment for me in my life to, to have kind of achieved my, my dream. Yeah. How has it been like, I mean, uh, it was Again, it was really fast for you to transition from school to company uh, and then now you're principal dancer. And it's so it was really just maybe it felt like a whirlwind or everything happened all so fast. Exactly, exactly. It was very intense, I think, because <laughs> I first had to deal with joining the year above me. Um, which was hard, of course, because I left all my friends in my initial year group and then joined this older year of students, uh, all auditioning for companies that year. So that was that was really scary and pretty tough. And then again, joining the company halfway through a year where I, I didn't join with a group of people that were all new. So I didn't really have friends initially to kind of, you know, rely on for guidance and support and help. It was all just thrown in there and I had to figure it all, all out for myself. So I remember I didn't know where the physiotherapy area was for a good few months. And then I plucked up the courage to ask one of the company members, would you mind showing me where physio is? Or do you mind showing me how I can sign up for a physio appointment or a Pilates appointment? I just had no clue. It was just in there and just find a way. Um, so it was pretty tough, but I think all these challenging moments um, give give a person a lot more strength um, to kind of deal with with that deep end situation. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it, it taught me a lot about myself and a lot about other people. Yeah, transitioning from student to member. Uh, Pia was asking something about it, and since it's related, um, she was asking if you can oh tell you more about the transition well you already noted how it was really difficult but do you uh feel like you would have done it any other way or you were fine the way it was you know just how it was dealt and how it happened so quickly yeah and um, i i wouldn't have it any other way i was so excited to have skipped a year at school and then skipped another half year at school and join a company faster than usual was mm -hmm. very exciting for me. And I, I was so ready. I think everyone's ready at the end of their student life to, to join a company and to start working with them. And of course I joined and you have all these dreams of doing 
these these amazing roles and I thought already to be in the Cour de Ballet in the Royal Ballet was incredible and then bit by bit you you know you want to go up a rank and up a rank and then um, it was really great for me because I joined at a time where I think there was kind of a rotation of company members as such um, and I got a lot of opportunities short notice last minute mm -hmm. um, and those are often extremely stressful but yeah. again teach you so much and you know you have to trust yourself you have to be on the ball um, and you know you're joining as a quarter ballet member and you're often told learn everyone and you think, what do you mean learn everyone? This one's going right, the other one's going left. How do I learn everyone? And you realize you just have to because if someone goes off and they go to you and they say, Yasmin, can you go in? You have to just say, yes, I'm ready, I'm ready. Um, and that happens a lot. There are a lot of yeah. last minute cast changes and I was asked to fill in for people. And there was one ballet where I did someone's place in the group of four women. And then the next day I had to do someone's group in the three women. And the choreography is completely upside down, back to front. Um, but it was, it was a very good learning experience for me to kind of have that quick brain to, to make the, the switch very, very fast. Um, and they're all really wonderful lessons for, for the future as well. So now I feel I can pick up choreography fast because I had to be in, in that deep end position. Oh, that's really a tough situation. I cannot imagine just, you know, like going through all of that and having to learn right and left and all parts. But yet, I guess it does happen in the company and things are really quick. And again, things really change, just like our situation right now where things turn upside down really quickly. But we learn to adapt and, you know, we learn to cope. It's really nice that you mentioned that. Um, let's go through uh, what you feel like um, was the turning point for your career because I've seen, you know, all your videos and I watched through a lot of them and I've seen mm -hmm. you grow as a dancer. And, but I want to know from you maybe like what you feel yourself like was the turning point for your career. Thank you. Uh, I would say um, there are certain roles that really make a mark on someone's career. And for me, one of these roles was definitely Romeo and Juliet. I was given this role when I was a soloist in the company and it was a huge honor and, and a huge opportunity for me to be given this, this privilege to dance this beautiful role that I'd watched from the sidelines for years. And it was my first role that was really storytelling um, and character developing. And so it wasn't just about the dancing and the technique. It was about the growth of a character and how Juliet progressed through this, this ballet. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved that experience so much. I got to work with Leslie Collier, who'd done the role millions of times and who's <laughs> also worked with Kenneth McMillan, who's the choreographer of our Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very, very... I would say life-changing for me to be trusted with that. Um, and then another role that I very recently debuted with is Tatiana in Onyegin. And oh. this role, again, is a beautiful character that develops throughout. And I love showing the growth and the layers to a character in these ballets. And another thing that inspires me very much is the music. And there's such gorgeous music. In both of those ballets, you've got the Prokofiev score in the Romeo and Juliet and then Tchaikovsky for Onyegin, which is just mm -hmm. dreamy. And I feel like the music just runs through my veins. And it just, it gives me so much as an artist to be able to express my version of that character and what mm -hmm. I imagine she would have gone through and be feeling. And it, it just gives me so much. And I feel like that feeling of, you know, when you just burst into tears and you cry because of whatever reason, but you actually feel better for it. It's that complete release of emotion. Um, and I love that I can tap into that, that side of myself and just kind of have this emotional release. And then the curtains come in and it's all over. It's, it's quite beautiful. Um, 
at the same time as, as the emotion that you go through too. So yeah, I love the characters uh, in these ballets. Mm -hmm. Wow, it seems like you really have like um, deep love for, you know, like um, your art and everything like as a whole. I feel like you're such a whole dancer, you know, you take in everything, <laughs> the stage and like all the emotions. <laughs> It sounds so wonderful. I hope I can watch you again, maybe after the pandemic or if the shows or they'd stream one of your shows, it would be lovely. Uh, the amateur dancer, she asked um, what you feel was the most difficult time in your career and how you overcame it. That's a good question. Um, I think a lot of dancers go through many difficulties, whether that's not getting a role and struggling with that, or whether it's an injury. Um, I think injuries mark really difficult times in everyone's careers, but they are completely part of this journey. Um, I've been really, really fortunate not to have um, bad injuries during my career and actually since I joined the Royal Ballet, I didn't have a single injury um, that took me off stage. Uh, so that was pretty, pretty special for me. But I knew that I felt every year I was starting, I thought maybe this is the year. I can't, it must be impossible to go your whole career without a single injury. So I don't know, every year I thought maybe this year, I don't know, fingers crossed. Um, but what happened uh, last summer, I was just walking on some boulders on the way down to a beach and I fell pretty badly and sprained my ankle. Um, and at the time the doctor said, oh, you'll be fine. Three weeks will be no problem. But my ankle was the shape of a grapefruit. I kid you not, it was huge. And obviously it took a lot longer and I think it was a, a much more serious sprain than he initially thought. And uh, it took me a little while to get back. And I think the problem with um, coming back from an injury as a principal is you can't ease in by doing a gentle short roll, let's say. You ease in by, by leading the ballet. <laughs> so yes, that's something that's quite daunting. And the ballet I came back to after, I think it was around six weeks off, um, and also doing some rehabilitation for my ankle as well, was a concerto pas de deux, the second movement pas de deux in Merlin's concerto. Um, and I managed to do one performance with just a standard audience, and the second performance back was a live cinema relay to the world. So it was quite nerve-wracking, to say the least, to have your second show after an injury, a live cinema relay around the world. But um, it, was, it was amazing, and I remember hearing that music before I went on and just feeling really teary because the music is emotional. Um, yeah. And at the same time, I, I felt so proud that I'd overcome this injury and I was back on stage having missed it so mm -hmm. much. And I had a really deep connection with this ballet because I danced this ballet um, when I was a third year student at the upper school. So oh. it felt really full circle that I danced this as a student. And I remember dreaming of maybe one day doing it with the company as a dancer of the company. So it was a really wonderful kind of um, accumulation of, of all those emotions and feelings that came with it. And then the second ballet after this injury was opening night of Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> so again, not an easy ballet <laughs> with a lot of pressure of an opening night. Um, so that's, that's something that, that is a bit of a challenge when you're coming back from injury. But I think with, with difficulties and low moments, you know, like I'm sure many people have gone through low moments during this lockdown. And sometimes it seems like it will never be over. And when there's no light at the end of the tunnel, I think we just have to remember why we want to do what we love, how it makes us feel, and you know what we what we get from it as artists. And there's there's something so great and powerful about overcoming difficulty. Um, so no matter what you do, even even if it's not dancing, even if it's a different passion. Um, just remembering how amazing it makes you feel um, to kind of pull through out of the difficult times shows so much strength. Um, and they're, they're great life lessons in themselves. 
What was the first soloist role in your career? Um, now I have to think back. I think I was given the opportunity to do uh, the Hoppy Fairy in Sleeping Beauty when I was still in the corps de ballet. Um, so that was, that's a, a really difficult solo where you're just hopping on one shoe and doing a lot of bores. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a solo opportunity I got. And obviously for a corps de ballet member, it's a wonderful chance to show um, your ability to the director and to your audience as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then a slightly more major role I was given when I was still in the corps de ballet is uh, the role of Olga in Onyegin, which is Tatiana's younger sister. So I, this, this ballet Onyegin is, is also a meaningful ballet to me because when I first joined, I was the mirror girl um, that does the, the reflection when Tatiana goes up to the mirror. So some people might not know it's actually a person behind there, um, but that was the first role I did. And then I did every single corps de ballet role in um, Von Jägen and progressed to getting the role of Olga, the younger sister, and then most recently Tatiana. So I've done every single female role in Von Jägen, which is quite fun. <laughs> so I know the ballet very well. It's a really beautiful ballet. I have seen um, parts of it. I haven't watched it as a full yet, but watching even parts of it is really, really beautiful. And the music, I think, of Onyegin is really wonderful. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. it, yeah. <laughs> Who are your favorite choreographers to work with or to collaborate with? Hmm. I have a few that I love to work with. Um, I would love to work with William Forsyth. I think um, he's created so many fantastic ballets. Um, and I especially love In the Middle Somewhat Elevated, which was really, really big uh, a few years ago, and it's still danced today, and it's so, so gorgeous. Um, we are so lucky to work with choreographers like Christopher Wielden and Wayne McGregor that we work with very, very frequently, and most recently we've had Crystal Pite come in and Kathy Marston. So we've got some women, women on the choreography team as well, which is fantastic. Um, so it's been really, really great. And Wayne McGregor's approach is very fast, uh, very intense, and um, you need to be really switched on to remember what he wants. And from one second to the next, he can say, okay, remember what you've done, but reverse it. So you try and reverse it and then your brain goes crazy and then he goes, okay, and now do it the correct way. And you're like, oh my God, like I don't remember what I did the first time. Um, so it's, it's, it can be quite stressful, but he, he gets fantastic results. And um, I love the way Christopher Wielden uh, works a lot with shapes. He, he often works a lot with arm shapes and has a lot of theme movements which kind of represent his style very well. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky to have those two top, top choreographers work with us. And then of course, all in the past, choreographers like Ashton and Macmillan um, and John Cranko, I just adore their work so much. So um, some good names right there. Yeah, some really, really good names. And their shows are also equally amazing. <laughs> I've seen some and it's really, uh, you know, they really speak to the heart also. Um, Anya Ballerina is asking how long it takes for you to sew a pair of points and go through, because you go through a lot of pairs since you're professional. <laughs> yes. Uh, I remember one year I used to count my point shoes <laughs> and I was around 120 pairs that season, um, oh which is a lot. Uh, one so season? Wow. In one season. Um, so that, yeah, that really is a lot to go through. Yeah. So I think to so and prepare uh, point shoes. It takes me about an hour and fifteen minutes if I if I want to do it well. So I start with. Um, actually, I'll show you. I'll show you a pair of mine. For sure. Go ahead. So wow. I like to darn the ends of my point <laughs> shoes, which this is what really takes the longest amount of time. Um, and I, I start by going over them once all the way, and then I just go over a second time on the top. Oh. And I feel like 
This makes the tips of the point shoes last a little bit longer and helps me with balance and my biggest fear, slipping on stage. So I feel like it just gives me a little bit more friction when it's on the ground rather than a hard uh, point shoe tip. Yeah. And then I sew crisscross elastics. I use this elastic that we're given at work. And then um, just to show you here, I do ribbon with elastic at the same time to just save a little bit of time. And then I do crisscross. And then what I do is I glue, I glue the bottom of this because it's happened to me in a performance. Um, it was Don Q actually. I started doing fouettes and I could feel the inside of this just bunching up underneath my foot like a knot. And it is oh so goodness. painful. <laughs> so I make sure I extra glue it down so that doesn't happen when you start to sweat that the, the bottom of it comes up. And then of course, when I get in the studio, there's a bit of bashing. Um, I also scratch and score the bottom of the point two to avoid slipping as well. Um, so yeah, that would often take me about an hour and 15 minutes per point shoe. And the upsetting thing about that is a pair of point shoes can be destroyed in an hour of rehearsal. <laughs> so um, when I do something like Sugar Plum Fairy or mm -hmm. Rehearsed on Lake, there's a lot on the left foot. And often I, I have no use for that left shoe uh, by the end of those rehearsals. So a pair of point shoes can, can die very, very quickly, which is really upsetting. <laughs> Have you ever just replaced one since you mentioned like the only the left side died or you'd replace them both at the same time? I tend to replace them both. Um, okay. And maybe if there's a, um, a rehearsal process where I need slightly softer shoes, then I'll just endure <laughs> that soft left shoe but okay. keep using the right. Because I feel so bad throwing away shoes. Yeah, so I think trying to sure. use them as much as I can. Um, and then I just always have some extra pairs of shoes. Um, and I've got some special guests coming to just sign and, and give them as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. Just to live on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. But so much point shoes, 120 pairs, was it? That's so much in a year. One season, I think that was a very busy season. Um, yeah. I was a first soloist. So I was doing solo roles and then getting some principal role opportunities as well. So I was, I was on a lot that year, um, <laughs> year before I was promoted. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is so much point shoes. I can't even count 120 point shoes or imagine having. <laughs> did you keep them all or did you just like, do you just have them stored away? No. Um, if, I, if I would have kept them, I would have had a mountain in my changing room. So... <laughs> Um, the Royal Opera House actually have um, a point shoe project where they collect old point shoes and I think they send them off to, um, to some kind of uh, schools around the world um, for, for some students to reuse or they create artworks with it as well. And I think they might recycle them somehow. I'm not very sure, but I think they have some, they, they've kind of taken care of that. So... I just had that to them. Do you have any other goals as a ballerina you feel like you want to achieve or you haven't done yet? Hmm, that's a nice one. Um, I, I would love to dance a little bit more internationally, um, just to have an opportunity to work with uh, different dancers around me because I think we can learn so much from, from others. Um, as well as allowing ourselves to grow. Um, but I had a lovely opportunity last year to guest with San Francisco Ballet, and mm -hmm. I did the role of Aurora in Sleeping Beauty with them. Uh -huh. And for me, I feel that helped me grow so much to take company class with them, with a different kind of group of people, and see how they worked as well. Um, and I feel like it really that really helped me grow as an artist as well. Uh, and also to try different styles of dancing. I love dancing the big classics, but I think I can also push myself out of my comfort zone to try and dance in, in different styles. So that those are two things that I'd really like for the future in my career. It's really exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing you grow and grow more as a dancer.
you're talking or you're from Italy right now, right? Yes, so I um, have been spending my lockdown time in London um, with my boyfriend, who is not a dancer. <laughs> and the reason why we're in Italy is because he's Italian. So he didn't manage to see his family for months and months and months. Um, oh, okay. we that Italy were opening their borders. We decided that mm -hmm. it would be a really lovely thing to come to Italy so he could see his family after all this lockdown time. <laughs> And I thought it's a really nice chance for me to get away and have a, a break from London, <laughs> London life a bit as well. Yeah, I'm sure it's been hard also, you know, like staying at home, not being able to dance. I'm not sure how it is in London. So you've just been at home most of the time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> London and England has been hit pretty badly. Um, so we were home the entire time. And um, the Royal Ballet Company, our director, Kevin O'Hare, arranged for us to have lino squares delivered so we can work on those lino squares, which was amazing because with point work, it made such a difference. I could yeah. finally do some turns without the risk of falling down on a wooden floor. So it was, it was such a help. And we've been doing ballet classes through Zoom, um, Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Friday. We've been given Pilates and strength training as well. So it felt really wonderful to be able to keep up with fitness and dancing, even though we were, we were locked down. So oh, that was wow, that's so good. It seems like you're being taken care of really well. And yeah, uh, I know it's hard for everyone. And yeah, but how are you doing during this pandemic? Because you mentioned you went back to Italy and, you know, have you taken up new hobbies? I'd love to know any thing you've been doing. Yes. So I, I think, you know, I, I love to be very positive and see something good in a bad situation. And I constantly want to learn and grow. Um, and I think you know, my identity is a dancer. And I think as we've been students, we've had schedules, we've had goals, we've had, you know, we want to progress to the next year, then you want to get into your dream company, you want to progress to the next rank. And then, you know, once you're a principal, you want to continue to grow and push yourself. And one thing I loved was dancing abroad um, and having experiences um, where you push yourself. And as soon as the lockdown happened, of course, that completely stops and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think at first I felt a bit powerless that I think, you know, oh, I used to have everything in control. I was in control of my, my trajectory and my goals. And now something else is in control and I can't do anything about it. Um, so I... I was having some Italian lessons um, at the time, and they of course became Skype lessons. So I had Skype Italian lessons twice a week, which I love because I adore languages and I hope to kind of put a few more layers on my languages over time. Um, and so I enjoy doing those lessons, being a little bit studious. And I also found a love for experimenting with cooking. Um, I adore food, I'm a big foodie, um, and it was really great to have time and energy to prepare big hearty meals for the end of the day. And having an Italian boyfriend meant that we could discuss what we would have for dinner at breakfast. <laughs> um, so we would sit down for breakfast every morning and decide what dinner would be tonight. And um, we would then go to fish lot from local fishmongers or the butchers or just the general uh, supermarket and decide what we would do and get inspiration from different cookbooks. Um, and so that was always fun. I really enjoy cooking and nutrition is such an important part of the dancer's life. Um, and something that I found really useful is how you can really heal yourself from the food that you put in your body, um, be it with an injury. I, you know, I kind of upped the calcium intake. I upped um, protein to try and do, have muscle repair. Um, and I also, I think it's so good for basic things like skin, hair and nails um, that you can really nourish your body by eating the right things. Um, and also to just keep your metabolism going. You know, I think often 
I've had a lot of students contact me um, worrying about gaining weight during quarantine time because mm -hmm. we're not able to do the exercise we're used to doing. And I just want to reassure everyone to just not panic and understand that your body is the machine that is helping you and you have to be kind to your body. You have to not hate your body. Um, I've, I've quite enjoyed uh, feeling a bit softer <laughs> during this time um, and just to not worry and know that as soon as you go back to your lessons and your exams and the exercise you're used to doing, your body will just click back and not to worry about that um but to to see food as you know food is good food is to be enjoyed um obviously you're not going to eat um, i'm not going to go and eat a full chocolate bar because i know that's not going to make me feel good but I, I have such a sweet tooth and after dinner i feel that the full stop to my meal is a little dessert so i don't um i don't follow any diet i don't have any um restrictions I listen to my body um, and what my body asks for, I, I give it. And I think that's, it's important to use this quarantine time to understand more about yourself. Um, and I think another interesting thing has been, you know, the waves of, of our emotions and how we're feeling. Um, and I've become quite sensitive to understanding different times of the month, how I'm feeling. If maybe one day I wake up and I don't feel as motivated I don't push myself, you know, I'll go, okay, today I'm not going to do any dancing because I feel low and I'm just going to look after myself I watch some movies and tomorrow will be a new day. And I think when you're kind to yourself, your body is cooperating. Um, so I, I try not to kind of fight with how my body's naturally feeling that day. Um, but I think this this time has, has been a, a rest as well because... For my whole life, it's just been 100 miles an hour. And for the last few years, I haven't had more than maybe two weeks off in a long, long time. So to have this amount of time off um, was a little bit scary at first, but then you just have to learn to, to, go with the, you know, to go with the current and just let life just carry you through and set yourself goals. I love making lists of things that I should do during the day, whether it's cleaning the house or doing a tick list of, of something I, I wish to achieve myself. Um, and yeah, I think just having a structure to your day so you don't allow yourself to lie into midday and then go and watch movies all day and then feel lost at the end of the day that you've not achieved anything. I think it's wonderful to set a routine, you know, wake up a bit earlier and, and also, now that we can go outside and get some fresh air, that's very important to clear the head as well. So mm -hmm. I've just been <laughs> nonstop with that. <laughs> no, it's really good. And I think you already answered your last question, which was about uh, how you'd suggest young dancers to deal with lockdown. And I think you already answered, you know, like creating routine. It's really important. It's so nice that you're able to go out. Actually, for us, we are not able to go out where we are <laughs> until... Okay, well. Until maybe I think the end of the month we're not, or maybe until August. <laughs> Everyone's been stuck in the house, feeling down. So I think the kids Everyone's are. Stuck in there like this. <laughs> 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 yeah. Maiko Suzuki asked, uh, "How do you prepare for performing?" a new role in terms of technique and expression. We can go through this first before we continue with the questions. Perfect. So I would start by watching a video if there is a video of this role that it exists out mm -hmm. there to get an idea of the, the shape, the overall shape of the ballet. Especially if it's a ballet that I've not seen before, let's say a Balanchine that's not extremely popular or well known, then I'll try and research it and get an idea of what the ballet is about. Um, and to give you a good example, I was recently in Japan in January before the, the, the pandemic really hit. Uh -huh. And I got a phone call from Alina Kujikaru saying, um, would you by any chance be able to take over a role for me because I've, I've hurt my shoulder? And I was performing in a, in a gala at the time um, uh, with new artistry. And... <laughs> I thought, oh, this would be incredible to learn this Balanchine ballet called Ballet Imperial 
And I've n I'd never heard of it really. It's not one that the Royal Ballet often did or has done at all during my time there. Um, so I thought, oh, this would be fantastic. I managed to find it on YouTube and I watched it. And I watched maybe the first sort of 20 minutes sort of sped up, just let me see what this is about. And I thought, yes, this would be a wonderful opportunity, um, a great challenge, absolutely, let's do it. Um, but what I didn't realize is when it came to it, I had two days to learn it um, and perform it on day three with Tokyo Ballet. Um, and as soon as I started rehearsing it, I thought, wow, this is actually a lot more than I expected. It's a good 45 minute ballet. Um, and everyone knows Balanchine is very, very tough stamina wise. So it was a big mental challenge for me as well. Every day I'd go back to my hotel room and think, oh my goodness, can I do this? So the doubt that's constantly, you know, you, it's like having the angel and the devil on the shoulder, <laughs> if you think about it that way. Um, so the angel was like, yes, come on, Yasmin, you can do this, believe in yourself. Uh -huh. You've been training all these years, you're gonna be fine. You know, you've got strong technique, you're gonna power through. And then the devil was saying like, no, I think it's too much. You should have thought this through. Is it too late to say no? Um, so that was an interesting experience for me. Um, mm -hmm. But going back to the question, um, <laughs> after having researched the video, um, if it's a character, for example, I would read a book on, on the character, um, or to use Romeo and Juliet as an example, I would read Shakespeare's text to get the context. Mm -hmm. Um, and with a role like Tatiana in Onyegin, I would read Pushkin's uh, novel in, in verse. Um, and to just get, you know, the whole character um, perspective. Um, if it's a contemporary ballet, it really is just getting it in your body is that muscle memory. So repetition will be key. So after my rehearsals, I would carry on going over it in my head and really plugging in the music on my journeys to work to just immerse myself in, in whichever ballet I would do. So those would kind of be the, the process that I would go through for whether it's a contemporary role or a role with a character. I really like that um, description with the angel and the devil. <laughs> I'm sure everyone has that little voice in their head where they feel like they can do it one minute and the next minute they think that they can't do oh, it yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's get through one uh, one that I really wanted to ask, but um, I feel it's really relevant in this time and maybe the people watching might feel the same, but I feel social media plays kind of a big role right now in dancing. But I don't think it determines your success or you know how good you are as well. And so we really wanted to ask this question and it's really important. Um, it plays so much influence in how dancers or young dancers think right now. So I feel it's really a relevant question to ask again. So how would you measure success as a dancer for you yourself maybe? Um, you know, like the experience you go through or anything. I completely agree with you. And I think social media has a lot to offer. It can be a really fantastic tool, but I think it could also, it can also potentially be quite poisonous to people. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's one thing back in the day where you made your success through your performances and your mm -hmm. communication with your audience um, when social media didn't exist. But now we rate our success on the amount of followers we have. And I think that can be quite dangerous because it's not real, you know, it's kind of, it's a superficial, um, it's a superficial front. Um, and I'm not slating social media whatsoever, but I think it is very important to stay true to the art form and stay true to yourself and not be um, taken off the rails by getting upset and seeing that someone else has more followers than you. It doesn't mean they're better. It just means that they're putting out content where more people want to see what they're doing next, you know, and um, it's difficult because in this day and age, we feel that social media uh, defines us, you know, that and especially during lockdown, it really was most people's way of creating, of communicating, and of getting validation by other people. And dancers, we are very, um, 
we're very sensitive creatures. Mm -hmm. And I call us creatures because I think we're not normal people. <laughs> we're not your everyday <laughs> bob on the street just walking yes. down to go to the shops. We're, we're very fine-tuned athletes and artists and we can be very vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I feel with social media, we rely on others' um, reaction. We rely on likes and attention um, and for people to tell us that we're great and wonderful. Um, and it can, be, it can be a slippery slope because mm -hmm. if we don't get the reaction we want, we, we might not feel like we're good enough. Um, mm -hmm. Especially for young students, you have to remember that the ultimate goal and you have to think of being a horse with those blinkers, you know, you're looking absolutely in front of you. It's about you and your future and don't get distracted with the accounts mm -hmm. that are going on either side of you. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand it's hard because we have our phones and social media has basically become like a digital magazine for us, you know, flicking through um, the pages of magazines that we used to do back in the day. But I think also it's important to take a break from social media. And I try and s switch off Instagram for at least one day a week. I want to do more than, than one day a week. But unfortunately, it is an addiction um, to see what else everyone else is doing in the world um, and to, to keep putting out your, your art out there. So I think just remember the ultimate goal and don't get distracted. You know, it's like being in, in a classroom and feeling like your teacher has a favorite that's not you. It's that, it's that kind of feeling where you feel a little lost and a little insecure, um, but you have to remember that you are your most important person um, and it's about your improvement um, that will get you where you want to be. So you just have to tune out the noise and remember your ultimate goal. So that's, that's the social media um, advice I would give, um, mm -hmm. which I hope that helps people. Um, but I think, you know, success is, success is not final, you know, it's, we're always striving to be better. And just when you hit a moment where you think you're happy with something you've done, then you feel like someone's maybe doing it better or that you want to be better yourself. That's, that's being a perfectionist. That's always striving to be better. And that's the wonderful thing about artists is we're always improving and we're always growing. So there's never a final goal. Um, it's a journey. And this is our lives as well. It's not just, you know, dance. Like we have to be fulfilled by dance, but ultimately happy with who we are as a human being, as a person. And you can get a lot from art and dance, um, but to be ultimately happy with oneself, that is the ultimate goal. Oh, that was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you an award right now. <laughs> it was really nice. But um, yeah, it was really wonderful. Yay, I know. Um, so much people were giving clapping hats earlier. So thank you for that. And I find it really important to discuss that right now because, um, well, as a teacher, and I know my students are here watching also, I've seen them kind of deteriorate throughout the pandemic. And I know it's also because of what they see online or what they can compare themselves to what's happening to other people or people in other places. The world is a lot, you know, smaller and maybe closer. It seems like people are more reachable, but at the same time, it's important to know, like what you said, um, the ultimate goal, which is, you know, just to be happy and, you know, just to spend time with yourself and tune out for some time. So that was really just the message I wanted to send to everyone. Uh, what advice you would give to your younger self to today? Uh, I love this one. <laughs> I was always forever worrying and panicking and doubting and comparing. And I think that's completely normal. Um, so not to fear doing that, but I would tell my younger self to trust, trust that life has a plan and trust that you can, you know, you can carve your way, you can carve your future and um, to not spend too much time panicking or doubting, to just let your mind be calm, especially at the end of the day. Um, I remember going to bed 
many times before a solo's evening the next day or before an exam and just panicking and going crazy about worrying about it. But just remember that the worrying about it won't change the outcome. So you just need to clear your mind um, and allow your, your body to be calm before anything um, that's maybe a bit stressful. Um, so yeah, the advice I would give to my younger self is not to worry as much, not to overthink. And probably right now, my older self right now would still be telling me that. So <laughs> I still have to learn as well, kind of, you know, not overthink things. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning process. And, you know, we just keep on growing and we keep on learning as always. Would you like to say anything else to your dancers? Um, other than, I mean, I've kind of just been talking nonstop, but I just <laughs> want everyone to, to keep their goals in their minds and not feel discouraged by this limitation of, you know, being, being confined to our homes. Um, don't, don't look at social media too much um, because remember that people can post and that, you know, we're human beings behind that. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes um, and people often put out the things that are perfect. So just remember um, not to take that um, as, as too, in a too serious way. Um, so yeah, just keep positive, know that this will be over at some point and uh, better days are ahead. <laughs> Hey guys, we hope that you enjoyed that interview. I know I'm super up right now. I guess I'm super on coffee. But I hope that you enjoyed the interview. I had so much fun again doing this live. I learned so much from this interview also about how to deal more with lockdown. And, you know, we're still in lockdown here in the Philippines. Probably about 100 and something days already and still counting. But I hope for wherever you are, you are doing well and you are just safe at home and stay inspired, guys. There's still hope and things will get better for sure in the next few years, if not um, get better slowly. But we will do it together and I hope that you enjoyed again. We hope to see you on our next vlogs. Don't forget to tune in and click again on our like and subscribe button if you like this. And yeah, that's it. Bye, guys. Thank you.